So the uh, reading this morning is on page 1179 of the Church Bibles. It's Philippians 2. And we're going to read verses 1 to 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome. It's great to have you with us. My name is Charles. I'm one of the associate ministers here. And it's just so good to have so many of us here today, whether you're here supporting the Westerns or you're a regular here. Uh, it's so, so good to, uh, to be together. And um, it's a great privilege for me to be able to preach on a day like today, um, the Westerns, obviously, last Sunday. And it's a day full of emotion, isn't it? You know, we're here we're full of thankfulness for the 10 years that the Westerns have given us in this place. Uh, we're full of sadness, aren't we? And full of grief that they're, they're moving on. Um, perhaps there's a whole range of different emotions, like maybe concern about, you know, what's the church going to be like without the Westerns? You know, so many of us have only known Christchurch with the Westerns in it. What's it going to be like? It's okay to acknowledge those concerns. Underneath it all, I hope there's an element of excitement that they're going on to do God's work in a different place. But however you're feeling today, my hope and prayer as we open God's word together is that we'd be strengthened in hope and strengthened in faith. Um, so let me just pray before we start looking at God's word together. Father, we're so thankful for today. We're so thankful for the Westerns and their example in this place over the last 10 years. And we just pray that we'd be open to hearing from you today. Whether we're here for the very first time or we've been here for 30 years, I just pray that we would be open to hearing your voice today through the words of Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you heard at the beginning, we've been in a series as a church called In the Gym, and um, we've been looking at discipleship disciplines. Of course, if you're someone who goes to the gym, you know that going to the gym requires commitment and dedication and hard work. And in the same way, when we talk about discipleship disciplines, we're talking about what we do. In other words, we're talking about the things we do to help us grow as learners, as followers, as you might say apprentices of Jesus. If you go to the gym, the hope is that you'll grow physically strong, right? That's what your aim is. In discipleship disciplines, the hope is that uh, you'll grow spiritually strong. That's what we're looking at. And so far, we've talked about reading our Bibles, we've talked about praying, and today we're going to be looking at serving in Philippians chapter 2. And before we look at these amazing verses, which, by the way, are one of my favorite verses in the whole of the Bible. They're just amazing verses. Uh, I want to start with a question, though, a question to each of you. How would you summarize, in one sentence, the difference between what a Christian believes and what maybe secular, post-Christian Britain believes? So what is the difference between what a Christian believes and what secular, post-Christian British society believes, in a sentence. So you might say, a Christian believes, dot, dot, dot. Or you might say, you know, typically, post-Christian, secular society believes this. 
How would you finish that sentence? As I thought about it recently, I've realized that it's not a very easy question to answer. There's probably many things that go through one's mind when you think about that. You might say, well, of course, a Christian believes in God. But when you think about it, that's not quite right in the sense that, of course, a Christian does believe in God, but of course, uh, the average person in secular society might also say, well, I believe in God. So it's not totally the right answer to that question. Or you might say, well, a Christian identifies as a Christian. But of course, the average person in secular society may also identify as a Christian. You know, if you look at the uh, recent census, or any, any census really, where people have to tick a box, they'd often tick the box Christian, wouldn't they? Whether they uh, understand what they're saying, whether they live the Christian life or not, they might identify themselves as a Christian and tick that box. And so just by saying, well, you know, a Christian identifies as a Christian isn't totally an accurate answer to the question if we're talking about differences. So I don't know how you'd answer that question. It's a bit nuanced, isn't it? I mean, I'm often surprised when I meet people who say, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead and yet still live completely like that wasn't true. As in, you might speak to a person who says that, and you say, well, you know, well, do you follow Jesus' teaching? Do you do the things that Jesus commanded us to do? And they might say, well, no, not really. Well, do you, you know, do the Christian thing? Do you go to church? Do you read your Bible, maybe? Do you hang out with other Christians? Well, no, no, not, not really. And yet they still might say that they believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Interesting, isn't it? It's complex. It's, it's nuanced. Of course, you might also meet people who, uh, you know, love Jesus' moral teaching, they love his values, what he represents. In fact, what, Christian, what Christianity has done over the centuries. They might really appreciate the impact that Christianity has had on the Western society and, and Britain as a whole. But they still might not uh, know that they're even living out these Christian values if they do so, or even that they're Christian at all. And so it's really a hard question. The answer to that question isn't immediately obvious, is my point. And so it takes a bit of thinking. But actually, the answer to that question can be found and lies in the verses that we just read. That's where the answer is found. You see, the difference between a Christian and the average person in secular post-Christian society is basically based on the question, who do they say Jesus is? Who do they say Jesus is? Because discipleship starts with lordship. Discipleship starts with lordship. It's about who is the Lord, who is the master, who is in charge? Who is the ruler overall? And of course, in the verses that we had read in verse 11, sorry, verse 9 to 11, we read, Therefore God exalted him, him that's Jesus. God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, discipleship, if you want to follow Jesus, starts here. It starts with, who do you say Jesus is? You see, the early disciples were so convinced that Jesus was Lord that they'd go around proclaiming from the very start, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. In fact, if Christian bumper stickers were invented at that time, it would say, Jesus is Lord, because that was the phrase they used. Jesus is Lord. And it's a very powerful statement, a very powerful statement, both um, politically and relig you know, in a religious term. It's basically saying that Jesus is higher than any other king. He is more supreme and higher than any other earthly ruler. He is in charge. He is master of all. But not only that, if you're saying that Jesus is Lord, you're saying that he is my master. You're saying he's my Lord. He's my ruler. This is what the Apostle Paul has to say in Romans chapter 10. The Apostle Paul writes Philippians, and this is what he says in Romans chapter 10. He says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Being a follower of Jesus means recognizing that Jesus is Lord and then joyfully submitting to his lordship. Basically, what that means is that if Jesus is in charge, if he's the ruler, then it follows that we do what he says. You know, if you're saying that Jesus is Lord, he's the master, then it means that therefore we do what he says. And so the difference between a Christian and secular post-Christian society is who you say Jesus is. Is he Lord or is he not? And actually what we find in British society as a whole, as a general term, 
is that we see people saying, I am Lord, not Jesus Lord, I am Lord. The culture tells us, doesn't it, to say, you need to back yourself. You need to uh, look after number one. The culture will say, spoil yourself. Do whatever makes you feel good. After all, you only live once. The culture teaches us time and time again to look out for number one. I am Lord. The focus is on us. You know, since the um, improvements in technology and the emergence of things like a smartphone, um, you'll all know that uh, taking a selfie has become a real thing now, hasn't it? You know, everyone gets their phones out to, to take a selfie. And I'm sure selfies were around before, say, 15 years ago, uh, but certainly in the last 15 years, it's become really popular. Uh, you know, you'll see people who even buy extension holders just to get a better view of themselves, right? Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with taking a selfie. If you're someone out there who loves taking selfies, I'm with you. Okay, I'll take selfies all day long. But, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that isn't it a great picture, literally, of what we're like as human beings? That we tend to hold the phone out, and us as human beings want to be the center of the picture. We want to be the center of the shot. We want to be front and center of all things. And the challenge of these verses that we had read is that Jesus actually kind of exhorts us, appeals to us, to actually turn the phone the other way around. And rather than us being the center of our lives, rather than us being the focus, we're to turn the phones of our lives, if you like, the other way around, and have other people in shot. Have other people as the focus. Care for other people, value them above yourself. And so rather than taking a selfie, we're to turn around and value others above ourselves. That's literally what it means to acknowledge Jesus as Lord that other people begin to be more important than ourselves. I've uh, recently began to love the uh, Heidelberg Catechism. The Heidelberg Catechism is basically a series of uh, questions and then answers used to help people understand the Christian faith more. And uh, I've particularly loved it recently, and I particularly love question number one, which is on the screen right now. Uh, I'm going to read it to you. It says, what is your only comfort in life and death? Big question, isn't it? What is your only comfort in life and death? I wonder how you'd answer that question. Well, this is how the Heidelberg Catechism answers that question. That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Aren't those amazing words? Such truth. You see, the Christian life is not I am Lord. The Christian life is Jesus is Lord. I am not my own and I belong to another savior. My hope is that in hearing my preamble as an introduction, you're asking, well, what does this look like? You're saying, yeah, Jesus is Lord, but what does it actually look like in practice to submit to his lordship? What difference does that make to our everyday life? And I'm gonna to touch on three things. This is not all comprehensive. Um, you know, there are many, many other things that this means, but at least in this text of Philippians 2, I think it means three things. Firstly, it means unity. So if you've got a Bible open, you can have a look at it. Uh, this is verse 1 to 2. Therefore, if you have any comfort from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. You see, the reality is that if you confess that Jesus is Lord, then you are united with Christ. You're literally one with him. You are comforted by his unconditional love, his tenderness, his compassion, and you share in and are filled with the person of the Holy Spirit. Since this is true of all Christians, Paul, who's writing this letter, appeals to us and the, the Christians at Philippi for unity, for us to increasingly become one. Did you know that the Christian church should not be one of division, but that we should increasingly become one? No division, but one, one love, one mind, one spirit. So the first thing that Paul uh, appeals to is unity in the body. Let's be unified. 
The second thing he appeals for is humility. These are amazing words. I've often preached on this at weddings. These are amazing words. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. You see, when divisions start to grow, we begin to put ourselves first, don't we? You see, when we do things out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, when we serve you know, others just out of enhancing our own reputation or standing, when all we care about is our own achievements and you know, how we look to other people, that's when division begins. But that's not how it should be in the church. It might be the case in secular workplaces. I suspect some of us have experienced this, where the culture is do anything you can to get ahead. Even if it means trampling on someone else, even if, even if it means putting down someone else, do whatever you can to climb the ladder to succeed. But that should not be the culture amongst Christians. Paul says, in, humi- in humility, value others above yourselves. Isn't that countercultural? That is so different to our culture that, say, that says, look after yourself, aim higher and higher and higher. It's so countercultural. And often humility is seen as weakness. But actually, when you encounter it in a person, it's so attractive, isn't it? It's so attractive when you see someone who puts others above themselves, who doesn't seek situations out to get promoted for themselves, who has genuine other person concern at a great personal cost to themselves. It's so attractive. I remember a few years ago, I was uh, in Zambia. I was doing some, some football coaching there. And uh, for a couple of days, I was with a, a chap who was helping me do some coaching, um, a, Z- a Zambian. And uh, he had a bracelet around his wrist. And on his bracelet, he had the words, I am third. I am third. And as a competitive guy as I am, as some of you know, that bothered me. I was like, why have you got a bracelet that says, I am third, on your hand? Surely you want to be first, right? So I, I approached him on one day because it bothered me so much. And I said, dude, why have you got a bracelet that says, I am third, on your wrist? What's that about? And uh, he humbled me because he said, it reminds me every day that God is first, everybody else is second, I am third. I was like, wow, God is first, everybody else is second, I am third. That's the mindset, isn't it? A fantastic mindset to have. And that's what Paul, I think, is encouraging us to have here. Firstly, unity, as I've touched on. Secondly, humility. And then thirdly, service. You see, in many ways, if you're looking at the passage, verse 5 is central to this whole passage. Verse 5 says, In your relationships with one another, have the mindset, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. That's the crux of it, isn't it? If you say Jesus is Lord, then in your relationships with one another, follow his supreme example. The world tells us to go high and far, aim higher, climb the social ladder, do whatever you can to tread on other people, put other people down. But Jesus' example is the complete opposite. He went down, lower than any of us have ever experienced, and then was exalted high. His example is full of humility and service. Just listen to these words again from verse 6 to 8. Who, that's Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. He didn't use his position for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. In some translations it says slave. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is Jesus, the ruler of the whole of creation, way more important than any of us. I don't think any of us here could make that claim that we're like, you know, we're the creator, we're the ruler, we're the Lord, even though we might think we are. Okay, he's more important than any of us. And yet he chose to humble himself and go low and go low and go low, taking on the very nature of a servant or a slave. Isn't that what Jesus taught us to do? Taught his disciples to do? This is in Matthew 20, it'll come up. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. 
You see, if you're here today and your desire is to grow as a follower of Jesus, it will mean following the way of Jesus, and that means humble service. Humble service. I've been a Christian now for maybe 21 years odd, and I found serving has always helped me to grow in my faith. I found that I've grown in many areas. To name a few would be perseverance. It's hard work, isn't it, serving other people? You have to persevere. I would say I've had to grow in prayer because you can't do it on your own. You need to pray. I'd say I've grown in humility, although I've still got a long way to go. I've grown in humility because it means valuing other people. And I've also grown in just a commitment to justice or a commitment to making the world a better place for other people. Uh, Just an example would be I remember in my 20s, I volunteered to serve uh, with the youth group at a Christian camp. Uh, A bit similar to New Wine, if you've ever been to New Wine. Uh, But we went to this Christian camp, and I was there with about 60-odd children from my youth group, uh, joined with thousands of others from around the UK. And um, I volunteered to go and uh, just serve on this camp. And I remember telling my unchurched, you know, non-Christian friends about this, and they were like, what? Why would you do that? You're giving up a week annual leave from work to go and serve at this youth camp. And they would say things to me like, are you getting paid? And I'd be like, no, I'm not getting paid. And then they were shocked when I told them that I was actually having to pay to go. So they're like, what? You're giving up annual leave. You're not getting paid. And you're paying to go and help these young people. That doesn't make sense. That's not a category even in my mind where that even belongs. But I'm so pleased that I did. You know, all my friends spent that summer going off to Ibiza and places like that. But I'm so glad that I did because there were some people in that youth group that became Christians. There were others that made significant steps in their faith journey. But that's what it means to serve, to give yourself, to invest in other people because you really believe that it's good for them and good for us. It just means stepping out of our comfort zone. This is what Paul has to say in Ephesians chapter 4. It's familiar verses to some. Christ himself gave. I'm not going to list the people there, but he basically gives people to his church. And it goes on, he gives these people to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the full measure of Christ. You see, as we serve others, the body of Christ is built up. The church is built up. There's lots of benefits to us and to the church. I haven't got time to go into great detail, but I often say to people who are new to the church that the best way to get to know people is to serve, to join a team, to serve, and they also grow in their faith at the same time. And by doing that, we're following Jesus' example, but we're also following the example of others. If you were to carry on reading in Philippians, you'll see that Paul, again, who writes this letter, particularly highlights Timothy and a guy called Epaphroditus. He highlights them because of their their example of service. And in Epaphroditus' case, right at the end of chapter 2, he says that Epaphroditus literally risked his very life so that he could provide care for Paul, which others couldn't do. He uses them as examples. And in our current context, we've had the example set of Steve and Sarah for the last 10 years. They've set a huge example for us. They've done loads, both seen and unseen, to serve other people and benefit the church. Steve will particularly be known for his work amongst children and youth, but these guys have also spent hours caring for people behind the scenes. Sarah's been making amazing cakes for years. We're going to miss those cakes, aren't we? But they've consistently shown up for people when they've needed a hand. They've been an example to us. They're going to leave a massive hole. They're going to leave a massive gap. But I believe that the gap that they leave is also a huge opportunity for all of us. Every single one of us now need to step in and step up to that gap to fill the gaps that they're going to leave. We might even ask ourselves questions. Who are going to be the ones that are going to step in to the gap and show hospitality to others? Who's going to step into the gap and serve our children and young people? Who's going to step into the gap and serve Little Acorns on a Friday or the base on a Friday night? Who are going to be these people who step in? Well, it's on all of us, isn't it? We're the church. Every single one of us have got a part to play. Let's not be people who just look to others to solve the, solve the issue. Let's be people who are like, I'm the church, I can help. I'm capable. I've got time, I've got talents, I can give that to the church. So many people in this church serve in many incredible ways, and we're so grateful and so thankful for all that you do. 
But my encouragement, my appeal today is for anyone who maybe hasn't yet started serving, maybe you've got capacity to do more, then I want to encourage you to step forward and help. It can be sacrificial, right? It might mean giving up a holiday like I did. One example. It could be meaning um, you're going to need to give up Netflix on a Friday night to be here to serve the young people, or whatever it is you do. It could be meaning that once a month, you're going to be asked to be out in the kids' work serving our children and young people because they, we, they really need you, and <laughs> you really need it as well. It could mean those things. It's going to be sacrificial, but it's so, so worth it. And by the way, it's hard, isn't it? But if you have a look again at verse 1, you'll see that Paul and God knows that we can't do it in our own strength. We're united with Christ and we share in the Holy Spirit. We are strengthened by Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit to do all this. We can't do it on our own strength. And so we rely on him. In the last couple of minutes, I just want to say that, just, just imagine a, a sports stadium where you have spectators in the stands and you have the players on the pitch. Now, sometimes in seasons of life, we need to be spectators. You know, if you're ill, you're unwell, maybe you're new to the church, it's okay to spectate, because maybe you're new and you're just checking us out and you're trying to work out whether this is going to be your home church. It's okay. But our heart and our hope is that people would work their way from being a spectator to being a contributor, a player on the pitch. And my hope is that all of us, or most of us, will begin to make that journey to being a, a participant, a contributor in the church in some way. You can help in many different ways, and if you want to find out more about that, then you can scan the QR code, or you can go to the welcome desk at the end. We have these flyers available if anyone wants to uh, sign, one up, or sign up and find out more. Just to say, if you sign one of these, you're not signing your life away, okay? When you sign one of these, you're just saying, I'm interested in finding out more, and then one of the team will get back to you during the week and really explain what it means uh, to serve and step in. But as I close, I want to remind us Following Jesus means that Christ is Lord. It means saying that Jesus is Lord. That is the difference between the secular post-Christian worldview and the Christian worldview. That is the difference. Jesus sunk lower than we've ever been. He took on flesh, was found in appearance as a man, and he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, for us, on our behalf, so that through faith in him, we can know forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Because of this, God has exalted him to the highest place and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I wonder today whether you've ever bowed the knee to Jesus and said he is Lord. In a moment as we sing a final song perhaps, maybe today might be an opportunity in your heart to say, yeah, Jesus is Lord. That would be a great response to the sermon. But for others of us, hopefully today has been a reminder of what it means to live with Jesus as Lord. It means lots of things, but in this passage, it means seeking unity, it means growing in humility, and it means humble service. Let me pray, and then the band will help us sing. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his ex supreme example. Thank you that he's not just our example, but he's our saviour and Lord. And so we pray today that you'd continue to fill us with your spirit. We're sad because of the people that we're losing. We're excited for their future. But we pray that you'd fill us with your spirit and help us to seek unity, to grow in humility, and to grow in humble service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.